In this section, we will be discussing how to determine an empirical formula and a molecular formula from a percent composition. So in a previous section, we talked about going from a molecular formula to find a percent composition. Now we're going to be going in the opposite direction. The empirical formula of a compound can be attained from its percent composition. In order to find the molecular formula of a compound, we will also need its molecular weight. This idea is important because if you have an unknown compound, there are experiments that you can run to determine its percent composition of elements. And also there is an experiment that you can run to determine the unknown compound's molecular weight. These two things together will allow us to determine the molecular formula of an unknown. So here's an example. We find that a compound is 13.2% boron and 86.8% .8 chlorine by weight, and we want to determine the empirical formula. And then if we are given that the molar mass of the compound is 245.1 grams per mole, we want to be able to determine the compound's molecular formula. In the first step, you want to assume a 100 gram sample. So this is arbitrary, you can use other weights, but in this case, I like using a 100 grams, so we assume a 100 gram sample. And then we multiply that 100 grams by the percent weight of each element to get the number of grams of each element in that 100 gram sample. Remember here, we are dealing with the mathematical percent. So when we discuss 13.2%, that's not what we use in a mathematical calculation. In a mathematical calculation, we divide by 100 and we use 0.132%. When I do these multiplications, I take my 100 grams, multiply by the percent boron. I find out that in my 100 grams, 13.2 grams of boron are present. Likewise, in this 100 gram sample, likewise, I take 100 grams and multiply by the percent chlorine. I get that in this 100 gram sample, 86.8 .8 grams of chlorine is present. As usual, we don't want grams, what we want is moles. So in the next step, we want to find out how many moles of each element were present in that original 100 gram sample. So we know how many grams were present. We, now we, what we want to do is calculate the number of moles present. Remember, if I take grams and divide by, in this case, the atomic weight, that will tell me the number of moles. We've previously determined that there is 13.2 grams of boron inside of our 100 gram sample. We then divide by the atomic weight of boron to find out that there is 1.22 mole of boron. We do the same thing with chlorine. We determined that there is 86.8 .8 grams of chlorine. We divide by the atomic weight of chlorine. We get that there is 2.45 moles of chlorine in our 100 gram sample. Now what we want to do is determine the relative ratio between boron and chlorine. We do this by writing a tentative formula. So we know that there's going to be boron and chlorine inside of our unknown compound. We write the number of moles as a subscript, and then we find the lowest number in the subscripts and divide through by that number. So of 1.22 and 2.45, the smallest number is 1.22. So we divide by this number. And what we get is the relative ratio of boron to chlorine from this calculation is for every one boron, we have 2.008 chlorines. However, th this cannot be. Remember, subscripts in molecular formulas and empirical formulas need to be whole numbers. So what we do is we go ahead and round off any of these subscripts that only differ slightly from whole numbers. So 2.008 is very, very close to two. So we are just going to round this to get to whole numbers. In the end, we get that the empirical formula is one boron to every two chlorines, or B1Cl2. So after this step, we can only determine the empirical formula. We do not know if this is actually the molecular formula. From percent compositions, we can only determine the empirical formula. Now we're going to try to find the molecular formula of the unknown. Remember when we were discussing empirical formulas, these were found by dividing the molecular formula by a whole number. So to go from the molecular formula to an empirical formula, we divided by a whole number. Now going into the other direction, we are going to take the empirical formula and multiply by a whole number to get to the molecular formula. And what we need to do is determine what this whole number is.
To find out what this whole number is, the first thing you need to do is determine the molecular weight of our empirical formula, or the molar mass of our empirical formula. Our empirical formula was B1Cl2. I go to the periodic table, I get the atomic weight of boron and two times the atomic weight of chlorine. We add these together and we get that our empirical formula is 81.7 grams per mole. I then find the ratio between the molar mass of our given compound, so this was given in the original question, and I divide by the molar mass of the empirical formula that we found right here. This is going to end up giving us a whole number. So the molar mass of the compound was given in the original question. We divide by the molar mass of the empirical formula, and what we get is a whole number. That tells us the relationship between the empirical formula and the molecular formula. This tells us that the molecular formula of the compound is three times greater than that of the empirical formula. So if we take our empirical formula and multiply by three, we will get our molecular formula. In this case, the molecular formula is B3Cl6. Remember that percent compositions can only give us an empirical formula. To find or determine the molecular formula, we need to know what the molecular weight of the true compound is. So what happens if you do not get a whole number after step four? So after step four, what we did is if our subscripts were very close to a whole number, we just went ahead and rounded it to a whole number. Sometimes we are not very close to a whole number, and so rounding it would be incorrect. So an example of this is if I have a compound that is 72.4% iron and 27.6% oxygen, and I want to determine the empirical formula for this. So just jumping in steps, step one says we multiply by 100. We know the weight of iron and oxygen in my 100 gram sample. We then divide by atomic weight to get the number of moles of each element inside of our 100 gram sample. And then we take those numbers and set up a tentative empirical formula. So this says that for every 1.30 irons, we have 1.73 oxygens. We then divide through by the lowest number, which was 1.30. When we do this, we get the ratio of iron to oxygen being, for every one iron, we have 1.33 oxygens. And in this case, 1.33 is too far away from a whole number to safely round. What you don't want to do is say, round this to one. It is too far away from one to safely round. When this happens, you want to multiply by an integer such that the result will be a whole number. So here, if I want to get 1.33 close to a whole number, I want to multiply by three. When I do this, I get that the ratio of iron to oxygen is for every three irons, I have 3.99 oxygens. This is now close enough for us to round to four. So in this case, our empirical formula was Fe3O4. So just remember that when you do this division, if you end up with a number that is too far away from a whole number to round, what you need to do is multiply by an integer that will get you a number that is close enough to round. So if you have 0.33, you want to multiply by 3. And a couple of other examples, if you have 0.25, you want to multiply by 4. Or if you have 0.5, you want to multiply by 2. So if I was to get an answer of 1.25, I'd multiply by four. That will get us to a five in the subscript. And if I get a, if I get a 0.5 in the subscript, I'm going to multiply by two. So in this case, it would get me to three. So these are kind of the three major examples of this. The 1.33, the 0.25, and the 0.5. 0.33, you multiply by three. 0.25, you multiply by four. And 0.5, you multiply by two and then you continue on with the rest of the question.